welcome to the Business Leadership Series, where we engage with leaders who are making an impact on their worlds and who want to share their knowledge and experience for your personal and professional growth. The following interview is designed to inspire you to become the best leader you can be. Your host, Derek Champagne, is the founder and CEO of The Artist Evolution, a full-service agency building successful brands, marketing tools, and campaigns, and also the author of the best-selling book, Don't Buy a Duck. And now, let's begin today's Leadership Series interview. Welcome to the Business Leadership Series, where our goal is to inspire you to become the best leader that you can be. Our guest today, I saw him at the Players Impact event in Nashville, Tennessee, at the uh, during the uh, NFL draft, and was impressed with his product and reached out and, and uh, wanted to learn more about him. And uh, that's Matt Hyder, the founder and CEO of Recoup Fitness. Matt, thanks for taking a few minutes with us today. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Hey, I'm going to start with your LinkedIn profile because I got a, I, I laughed out loud with it. <laughs> I got a kick out of it, which I'm sure so <laughs> many do. But let's just start there because I don't want to ruin the surprise, okay? You, your LinkedIn profile says, I barely graduated high school with a 1.9 GPA. After barely graduating, I found my path in entrepreneurship. I ran four startups that failed miserably. First of all, I appreciate the honesty. I fell in love with the process and kept pushing until I created Recoup. And, man, you have – you have really come on to something. You went from having an $8 prototype in your parents' basement to building a multi-million dollar company uh, used by NFL teams and athletes and so on. So featured in Men's Fitness, Men's Journal, uh, you've been on Today's Show and so much more. Uh, th- let's, uh, first of all, welcome to our show. And Do you mind just kind of give us, tell us about you and your background. We love to hear a success story like this. So go, let's go back to that barely graduated high school and, and finding your path. I want to hear about that first and then we'll get into what you're doing now. Yeah, Absolutely. So as, I, uh, as you read off, I barely graduated with a 1.9 1. 1. GPA, and yes, you can graduate high school with that, <laughs> shockingly. To get, they want to get you um, out of there, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I feel, I feel like that's what it was at the end of the day. Um, but just, it wasn't really my thing of school. Um, I always try to do things my own way, like growing up, and that doesn't transition to the best way of schooling. Um, but after high school, I realized I needed to at least get my act together more and then ended up going to community college at Denver and left there with a 3.9 GPA, um, got into Boulder, uh, CU Boulder, and then studying political science up there. And during an internship uh, with the former lieutenant governor of Colorado, Barbara O'Brien, I just saw a lot of inefficiencies and really tried to fix them. And I failed miserably in that first business, but I just fell in love with like the process of creating and working for myself and what you put in is what you get out. And I thought that was one of the coolest things to have happen. Yeah, no kidding. That's a great lesson to learn, a powerful one that some don't learn early enough. Where do you think you get that perseverance of, of, of you know, you, just, you see things differently, which my favorite people do. I like to learn from people that, that see the world differently and just kind of make their own path. Where does that come from? Where, have you seen it? Did you have family that did that? I mean, what, what was your inspiration? Survival? Um, I, would say my, <laughs> I would say my inspiration just came from, I, like, growing up, I always solved problems my own way. Hmm. And I just kept doing that as I got older. Of like I had internal headgear and braces. So I had a mouthful of metal. And um, I would, and the braces would uh, cut up my gums at night. And so I developed a mouthpiece, or just put a mouthpiece at the top and bottom. Soon realized I couldn't breathe with it at night. So then I cut out the bottoms and, re- and refit them just to fit over my braces and internal headgear. Um, which is like one example of how I always did things my own way. Hmm. And that's why I love the product space so much is you can create stuff out of different types of materials to solve an issue. And it's things that can affect everyday lives, which I think is one of the coolest things about our business and recoup as we get to make people feel better. And it started with an $8 prototype because I just wanted to feel better. Yeah. And and great that you're asking those questions. A lot of us don't. And I think it's important to ask questions of how can it work better or why doesn't this work instead of just accepting a system or a product for what it is. So I love that solutions and and finding a problem and finding a solution. Tell me about uh, to tell me about the, developing this product that did work and tell me about maybe your, about your college professor telling you, which happens often in the stories I hear, now this business idea won't work. <laughs> tell me about that story. <laughs> um, yeah, so she, I was in an entrepreneurship class because um, I really thought I was going to learn. I knew I really wanted to do that, and I was in school already and figured I might as well take some classes, see what I can learn from it. 
but her path was all about old school marketing of mm. guerrilla marketing, putting stickers out there, all of that. And I'm like, this is just so wrong. It's mm. you're not catching up with the times of people's attentions aren't, aren't there anymore. Like billboards, for example, when you drive, you don't really look at billboards as sad as it is to say, most people are on their phone, texting, changing music. Like you need to go where people's attentions are at. And I would argue with her about this a lot. Um, and actually, so we had to do a business plan um, for a business, and I started recoup at the time. She told me it wouldn't work, and didn't believe me that the 49ers were our first client. Came in with a check, and she still, and I still got an F in the class. It's like okay, um, wow. I don't know many other people in school or even in the sports space that their first client was a professional team, and I thought that was very intriguing and knew right then and there that. I need to drop out of college because I have a pro team that is paying for the product. It wasn't for free. Hmm. And I realized like what I was learning there wasn't it. And so I thought the coolest part was, is I had an opportunity to take control of my education and I still read an hour or two a day learning how things are changing because we live in the information era now where everything changes so rapidly and you just have to be on top of those changes and they weren't. And so I just wanted to really, and I just really want to take control of my own education. Yeah, I think that's great. And, you know, we, you know, in defense of education, we have a, an internship here at the Walton School of Business and kids get college credits. But I usually tell them, and I know some great professors, but I usually tell them here at our agency is that you're going to probably learn more in a semester real world experience than you will for your entire college career. You're working on real campaigns in real time and real things are happening and there's pivots and there's change and there's advancements in technology and partnerships. And, and you're going to see that you can't teach that quickly enough in a classroom and, and it's hard to keep up with it. Yeah. And I don't mean to like knock the school system at all. I just believe that there's such a different way to do it. Um, like especially with a lot of kids that are doing marketing right now, they have tech, they, they're buying textbooks of marketing. Uh. But the thing is those, by the time the kids get the textbooks, the marketing landscape has already changed. Right. They wrote them a year ago and those old methodologies are gone. But I know some professors, um, I still actually am heavily involved with some of the uh, local colleges here and go back and talk to high schools about entrepreneurship and tell them like, go use Feedly. That's I think one of the best apps where you can be on top of everything that you want to learn about. Hmm. And that is where I think you should put your education at is towards those blogs and everything. If you're doing marketing, but like there's other aspects of business that school really does help out with, um, such as like the financial side of things where I've dropped the ball a lot and I've got some of the best mentors. Um, her name is Carolina Gash. She uh, used to do fractional CFO work for OPEC huh. and did a lot of did a lot of big stuff. And she taught me how to read financial statements, how all the money works together, how money works as a whole. And I think that was one of the coolest parts of this whole journey is the mentors I'm able to have. And I think school should really push for kids to do the internships, learn about the business world, Uh but also try to seek mentors to help them out of, because you learn so much more and they can take what they're learning in a classroom and apply it in the real world because they are actually doing it. Right. And if you, you know, if if you are the right type of student or the right type of mentee, a good mentor will take you on. And I've studied a lot about mentorship and you know, the great mentors are sometimes it's just cause they were asked. And if you don't ask them, you yeah. don't have the opportunity. What, what is your advice? Let's talk about that for a minute. How do you go? Like what, what qualities do you look for in a mentor and what qualities should you have as a mentee in order to approach them? Um, so I think it start, first starts with yourself as a mentee. Yeah. You have to be willing to shut up and listen. <laughs> um, you're going to them for a reason. Like you would be surprised about how many times, uh, people that go, that mentees try to just don't listen and they try to talk over the mentors, which is the biggest mistake ever. Mm -hmm. Um, Like for example, we have um, just Ryan Keel uh, that I met at the NFL draft. That's Mm -hmm. the former SVP of Under Armour. When he talks, I shut up 100% because he has so much to offer. And it's just asking people of when you see someone that is where you would like to be or a place that you're struggling at is just, ask if you're around them or even use LinkedIn. Um, I think it's a very underutilized tool that a lot of people don't know how it works the correct way, but send people LinkedIn message saying you're doing this and you want to learn more. I'm looking for a mentor. Do you have time to get coffee? 
Mm -hmm. um, and always be on the out lookout and ask them for coffee and make sure you go in there with a set of problems. Um, just don't go in there and expect them to give you a list of here's how to do it all. No, go in there. Like, here are the problems. How have you solved them in the past? Here's my suggestion. You, you have to, as a mentee, you have to put in more effort than the mentor because you have to get them excited because their time is super, super valuable, way more valuable than yours. And yeah. you need to go in there strategic and have this list of problems. And then it shows like you're thinking about it and you want to improve this aspect. I think that's how you like really build that relationship. Great advice, man. And, and again, you know, you can spend and it took, I'm, I'm really proud of you because here I am 43. I feel like the old guy. It took me a long time. I've, I've had nine companies and I failed at four of them. You, you've had your shares of failures and successes now too. And, and a lot of times I can point back to my unwillingness to, well, back in the day, we kept our cards close. We didn't share, we didn't collaborate and I didn't bring on mentors. And I, I just, I failed because I was unwilling to ask for help or didn't know to ask for help when I could have saved either failure or saved years of guesswork and pain and lost money and mistakes by going to someone that already been in my position. And, and, and so, you know, it took me way longer than you. So good job on, on getting that early on and, and utilizing that. It's a huge, huge resource. Thank you. I, I learned the hard way. Uh, I lost <laughs> half a million dollars of investment hmm. because I thought I knew everything and I didn't. And I, that was, I'm a, <laughs> A lot of entrepreneurs, we like to learn the hard way. Yep. Um, and I learned the hard way with that. And that was a lesson that stuck with me of, okay, I don't know everything. I need to <laughs> really sit back and listen and learn from experts at this. Yeah. So it, sometimes you yeah, have to learn great. the hard way. It's, it, it's easier if you don't have to. Yeah, you know, there's expensive lessons sometimes, but you, you, you've learned you've learned that one. And so can I, let's fast forward a little bit. Let's talk about numbers. Let's talk about units. Let's talk about, I want to hear, let's talk about, I, I believe I saw you with Brandon Marshall. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah, he was at the, he was um, presenting yeah, with so, you at the event, right? Uh, no, so that was a different company, but we have, okay. a, we do a lot of stuff with, uh, with Brandon Marshall. Tell me, he's tell a, me about that. Tell me about Brandon awesome Marshall guy. and tell me about, uh, just tell me about the growth of your company because to go from an $8 idea and, and being told that it wasn't going to work to, to getting an NFL team as a first client, just tell me the growth from there. Yeah. So our first client was an uh, NFL team and I had the misconception that it was going to be super easy from this because hmm. of branding. Um, it was not. Uh, so, and then in 2016, we did uh, about $86,000 in uh, revenue. And then in 2017, we did 461000 um, And that's when we started working with a lot more professional athletes, talking to them, um, trying to get them behind the product, um, which was really cool to see that, of them really promoting it. And mm. I feel like I have a different relationship with them because they are – they're, they're close to my age. They're living out their dream and I'm living my dream. Right. And it's just in a different fashion in the same field. And I think too, when people have the misconception of pro athletes are these superior godlike figures and they're not, they're just normal people. Right. That, like you treat them as a normal person. You don't want to be treated any differently. Um, I treat the professional athletes the same way I treat uh, someone that's bringing me a drink, anything like that. I, I'm a firm believer. Doesn't matter what you've accomplished or who you are. Everyone is the same. Everyone has the same value, huh. and you just need to treat people the same. Um, so that really helped out a lot because they, the athletes, love the product so much that they started bringing it into the locker rooms, telling other players, telling the trainers, and that's how we're able to grow um, on the professional athlete side. Um, but during that growth of from 16 to 17, we're still hand making. Um, still hand assembling everything, shipping ourselves. And we realized we couldn't grow unless we fixed a lot of that. Hmm. So the first three quarters of 2018, our, th our revenue was barely 200,000. I think it was like 195 ish right around there. Um, because we spent so much time fixing supply chain, getting new manufacturing, um, creating a higher quality product, learning more about our target audiences. And then Q4 is when, we uh, really, that's when everything switched for us. Hmm. We did half a million dollars in revenue in 19 days um, <laughs> during holiday. Um, that was crazy. We were flying in stuff from China. You can actually overnight things from China, just so people know, um, <laughs> just to keep up uh, with the demand. And then this year, so we ended 2018 with um, $827,000 in sales. 
And in 2019, we kept up with this momentum and we have, we're going to hit $950,000 in five months. Hmm. So we, and we are on track to over six X our revenue from last year to this year. Wow. It's kind of crazy. Awesome. Great story. I'm so happy to hear. Uh, I'm happy that we're in the heart of it with you. So you're, you know, you're going through it right now and it's, it's exciting. I mean, you just you did end of the you know, last year, took time to revamp. That's hard to do. That's painful to do, but it's a necessity. And so I'm glad you did that. Um, how exciting to look at the growth. What do you look at as your greatest challenges right now? Uh, as you continue to grow like you are? Um, keeping up with demand is our biggest challenge that no one ever really talks about, that <laughs> when your business grows this quickly, how do you fund it? Um, this type of growth can actually kill your business faster than a product that doesn't sell. Right. So we're really going through of keeping up with demand. Like we projected to only sell, we just released our new product on Tuesday. We only projected to do about $10,000 for the whole month. And we are already closer to eighteen thousand wow. dollars, and this is just our pre-sale, mm. so that's a big issue. Um, and, it's, and the other side with consumer product goods is you have to preload inventory for holiday, and it's an art form to do all of that. So we're going through that, um, hiring on staff to keep up with demand. Um, it's very, very difficult. Uh, it's very, very fun, and I would say like the most difficult thing we're going through right now is we are we're a team of four. We're very, very close knit. Like we are 100% a family and it's how do we keep our, our company culture, how we all work together as we expand out to other people. And that's a very difficult task that people don't realize how hard that is, of how to get personalities to mesh together during this growth stage, like how to keep people motivated, um, how people all work together. Every person works differently. They have a different chemical they have a different makeup and how do you combine all of these together to achieve success it's a very difficult challenge but i i have a lot of fun with it and i have a great team that supports me and helps me out with it yeah that's great and, and uh again another lesson that took me a long time to realize because i liked making the product i like to create but i wasn't necessarily interested in the building the leadership and the culture side of it and I, i'm pretty honest about that and i share that i basically after having seven companies woke up one day and had two bad realizations one is uh-oh i'm a leader <laughs> number two uh-oh i'm an un <laughs> unintentional leader because i don't feel like it <laughs> and so I, that's one reason yeah. we do this show i went on a quest and said well you don't really have a choice derek you cannot grow without having the right <laughs> people and you can't do that without building the right culture and understanding that part of it so you know too bad that's part of the gig and so you know we start by loving creating and building and being visionaries in quotes uh, but then there's a lot more to it and for sustainability you have to put the time into building those other parts of it and it almost seems like building the product side and the the the, the all of that chain is sometimes almost easier in some ways than building the correct culture and the team to sustain it yeah, absolutely. I agree 100%. And I think another pro or another pr hard problem is going transitioning from a founder to a CEO. Mm. I think that is a very is a huge problem that people don't talk about enough. Like I'm living it now of I'm used to doing everything and then I had to learn how to start delegating this stuff um and that's why it's so important to have a team that you can delegate delegate to that are smarter way smarter than me that achieve more things than I could. And it's proof with our numbers and who they are, but it's how your role changes of like, you need to deal with the numbers more. You need to look at when a problem is going to occur. Like knowing all of this type of stuff is very, very difficult. Hmm. And I think there's just not a lot about it. And I think it's a big problem why startups start failing when they get into the money and raises like that we're entering. And I created my own, little CEO school of 10 to 15 mentors that all bring in different backgrounds of all aspects of business. And it's been one of the most amazing changes in my life and still going through it. And I will be probably until recoup sells, but I'm enjoying every second. Like I get to learn some amazing stuff and really I, wise. And that's that a big problem. That. That, yeah. Very yeah. wise as you're doing and that. It's, it's difficult. And I just think a lot of founders, don't really understand how it is to be a CEO. Like I don't even like to classify myself as a CEO yet because I still have so much further to go and so much further to learn um, what this new role is for me and how my life is changing towards this. 
And it's critical to make that transition to grow your company the right way, in all fairness to, to the company. And, and uh, you have to learn. I was talking to someone in an interview earlier and asking them how they did that CEO transition and because they like to be on the front lines. And it was, you know, they had to learn to do that other role because it was important for the growth of the company and for the mission and vision they had. Hey, I want to talk for just a second about the product itself because we didn't. We've got a few more minutes. So tell, tell me about the product. I kind of glanced over that because I know that I got to see you demonstrate it. Tell me about what the product and what's so special about it. Yeah, so our first product um, is the Cryosphere. It's a cold massage roller. Um, so you unscrew the lower handle blue. You place the ball in the freezer for two hours, and it stays cold up to six. Hmm. Then you can use the ball outside the handle to recoup um, your feet. Plantar fasciitis is a big market for us. Hmm. Your calves, hamstrings, hips, and lower back. And then in the handle, the ball free rolls across any muscle group. Hmm. Um, so it's a full body recovery with massage and ice. And I, as a former athlete, quote unquote, um, I just want, I disliked ice cups, foam rollers, had a bunch of problems and lacrosse balls did as well. And I wanted to solve all of that with one product was that was the goal. Wow. So what's the new product? Ooh, the new product is really, really cool. Um, so our Natalie CEO, our, our COO, Natalie deserves 100% of the credit. Um, she took this from start to finish and it's cool to watch it happen. Hmm. She created a cold compression sleeve. Um, so it's, uh, it's a compression sleeve that has uh, cooling gel in it that doesn't get hard unless you get it to like negative 50, which huh. is pretty hard to do. Um, you slip it over uh, your arm or your leg, and then we actually partner with a company called Bola Technologies. Hmm. They are huge in the med device space. Um, they People may have seen their stuff as like the shoes that you don't actually have to tie anymore. You just push down and crank. Right. So we took that technology and applied it on the sleeve you slip that over and then you just twist uh, the BOA system. And so all the consumers can control their compression now. So if you get like an injury on your knee and it's your knee is normally too swollen to do this, you can just pull it over and not use BOA. But if it's smaller and you just want to feel better after a run, you can get it tighter. So it gives mm. users all the control to their compression based on what they're trying to achieve. And that's re- what we really wanted to do as well with this company is give recovery back to the consumer because no one, uh, no one knows your body better than yourself. Right. You're in pain, you know, you're in pain. And so that was, and it's cool to see that. And it was, it's really cool to watch her take this from start to finish and huh. learn the entire process. And she just did her first um, interview yesterday with 5280 magazine, a local awesome. magazine here in Denver. And it was really cool to like watch her do all that because she deserves 100% of the credit. Super cool. I love that. That's great that you were able to incubate that new product and and develop it there and have someone on your team uh, see it to fruition. Tell me, uh, we've got just a minute or two left. I was curious about distribution. Where do you sell? What does that look like? Because you've got the PR thing figured out. You guys are doing great with that, uh, which is super important uh, with the endorsements and those things. But what is, how do you, how does the product sold? Where do you distribute it? Um, So we do a lot uh, through our website. So just recouppitness.com or on Amazon, but we're really growing our B2B side. So um, a lot of, it's called Jackrabbit Sports. It's a specialty running store. They have 58 locations across the country. Um, and then actually a lot of cryotherapy clinics. Our mm. sale, our head of sales, Chelsea, just partner, uh, got a partnership with Cryo USA, where we're rolling out to 400 locations um, nationwide. Wow. So there will be in a lot of different places, um, as well as physical therapy clinics. So we're doing that model a little bit different. Mm. Um, you, you'll pro- users may see us in some of the, wherever they go to recover is a big spot for us. So it's where a lot of competition isn't going. Wow. Very cool. I love what you're doing. Any, any, uh, any final thoughts you want to share with us on, on building a company like this, any other big aha lessons, like what's the top two or three lessons or the top lesson that you've learned so far that like, screams out to you as a must know, uh, that, that, that happened to you. Um, just know that entrepreneurship is nothing like people say it is. It is a grind of a game. You need to go through a lot of perseverance and just like, and you have to make sure it's what you love to do. Yeah. No matter what I go through the day, the ne- the next day is a brand new day. And I get to wake up and live my dream every single day at 26 years old. Hmm. And I think that is a very important lesson that a lot of people don't ever get to achieve. Um, and then on top of that, I would say, 
take care of yourself during the process. Yeah. Um, I got very fat during it because I was <laughs> working ridiculous hours and eating terribly. I got up to 220 pounds hmm. and I'm naturally 185 and luckily got back to that weight. And I would say the mental side too, it's, it's a mental game. Hmm. And I, I have a life coach now that really Good. helped me get my whole, my head, my head straight. And I think a lot of entrepreneurship need that. You need an outlet to, to let it all out. Cause you can't tell your employees everything. You can't tell your friends everything, uh-huh. but someone like that you can. And it's, this game is all mental and you just need to take care of yourself. But you know, I, again, like, I will, you're, you're sharing things that I wish I'd known 20 something years ago. And I'm, I'm the old guy here, but I share that I was an entrepreneur back when that wasn't a cool word and people be like, awesome. So when are you going to go get a job? Right. And entrepreneurs <laughs> yeah. ship it with shark tank and all the things we have now and the, the, you know, the incubators and all these things, it's become a cooler thing, which I like. Uh, but, uh, it, you know, it is, there's a lot of, there's a lot of, there's a lot of silos and loneliness and isolation that happens in entrepreneurship that people don't realize. Cause you're, you're surrounded with a lot of people. And it wasn't until just a few yeah. years ago that I was able to join a mastermind where, where we were able to hold each other accountable. And there's several owners and founders where, where we're asking the tough questions and, and we're uh, helping with accountability and balance and life and health and spirituality and, and, uh, and, and family time and hobbies and just going to, you know, you've got to rejuvenate and take care of yourself too, or someday you won't be able to take care of the things you love. And, and entrepreneurs, a lot of times the way we're wired is, man, we just, it's not even work for us. It's really not. We could just burn the candle both ends until we're, until we die. <laughs> I mean, I know I could, <laughs> it's just, it's fun. Yeah. It is. And it's like, like I said, I don't work at all, but right. I, but I have a lot of stress on me. There's a, mm. I got to keep everything going. I got to keep up with the growth and you just got to let it out sometimes. And yeah. I think people should just really go get the help that they need. And it's okay to ask for help. Like entrepreneurship, entrepreneurs have one of the highest suicide rates. Yeah. Um, it's the highest suicide rate in any profession. And I can't remember what it is outside of the national average, but it's much, much higher. Huh. And it's because of sleep deprivation and the stress, everything like that. So I would like, that's like the one thing is like, make sure you can just keep your head on straight and find that help that you need. I, that changed my life yeah. a lot was going to get that help and trying to figure out how to balance all of this. Like it's balancing is hard. That's for sure. Yeah, it really is. And there are, you know, one of my mentors says that balance is a misnomer. And, you know, when you, when you put focus on one thing, you miss it on the other. And just sometimes as entrepreneurs, we just have to accept that it is a misnomer. It's not possible to get perfect balance. And he uses the example of the, the Panama Canal and how there's tension on both sides. And when you feel tension, that's healthy. It means that you're getting pulled. And that's your recognition of going, wow, I'm, I'm being pulled in different directions with all the things I have going on. And, and so it allows you to look at, you know, how healthy am I in balance and understanding the seasons of, of entrepreneurship too. Hey, Matt, I'm proud of what you're doing, man. Great. It was great to, uh, to, great to see you to demonstrate the product in Nashville. It's great to talk to you. I look forward to watching the next great things that you're doing. Um, if our listeners want to know more, do they go to recoupfitness.com? Yep, recoupfitness.com. And if anyone wants to reach out to me directly, of you're starting a business, you want some help, just email me just at matt at recoupfitness.com. I always love to hear what other people are doing and try to help out where I can. I feel very lucky in this position and want to make sure I can give back. Very generous of you. We appreciate that. Again, we've got Matt Heider with Recoup Fitness, uh, just a phenomenal product and a phenomenal story. And uh, we look forward to watching the next great things you're doing, Matt. We'll uh, talk with you soon. Appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me. You've been listening to the Business Leadership Series, where we engage with leaders who are making an impact on their worlds and who want to share their knowledge and experience for your personal and professional growth. This interview was designed to inspire you to become the best leader you can be. 